the words of Thoth in the Emerald Tablets compared to the words of Jesus, or known as, better known as, accurately known as Yeshua in the modern day Bible, right? So we're going to compare the words of Thoth from ancient times to the words of not only Jesus, but even a couple of his disciples as well. And we're going to see if there's a correlation between what's been said, what's been written in the biblical account versus what was etched and written by this man himself, Thoth the Atlantean priest king, because he actually authored his own tablet. He did not use a scribe for the animal tablets with an S plural. He wrote that one himself. So his words from 36,000 years ago versus uh, the biblical words, which were written between 100 AD to 900 AD, more modern times. As a matter of fact, when people try to tell me that I'm into this new age stuff, I go, no, actually, you're in the new age. I'm in the old age. Like the stuff that I research is like deep, deep antiquity, super ancient material. And most of the religions of the world cropped up and popped up only in the, uh, you know, from 1 AD on forward. So, of course, you have some of the the ancient religions, which uh, I don't even call them religions like Taoism and Buddhism. They're not really per se religions. Uh, I'm talking about things that can literally turn you into a zealot, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, things like that. Um, those are new age religions, you know, uh, Jehovah Witness and, and you know, you know, all these things, they're just, they're all, they're all fairly new. They just popped up on the scene. They didn't exist in ancient times. They're all fairly new. Actually, a lot of them have very, very recent accounts. If you talk about the Latter-day Saints and so forth, right? So we're going to take a look into Thoth's work in the animal tablets. And we're going to see some of the correlation between ancient text and the modern Bible. And then you be the judge. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Okay. <laughs> That's what we're going to take a look at. So I'll be doing some reading from my own book today, The Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. Still a bestseller. Still a bestseller on Amazon. And the book is also available on my website, 4 Knowledge with the number 4, 4 knowledge.com Okay? Let's have a look here. All right. <clears throat> I'm in right now. Where am I at here in terms of the... I'm in the Emerald Tablet, tablet number one. And Thoth said, but in a time yet unborn, I will rise again, mighty and potent, requiring an accounting of those left behind me. Another interesting statement made by Thoth many thousands of years before Jesus tells his disciples that he will rise again. And that's in Mark 9.31. And Thoth said, then beware, O man of Chem. He's talking to the people of Egypt, but before it was Egypt, the real name is the land of Chem. If ye have falsely betrayed my teaching, for I shall cast ye down from your high estate into the darkness of the caves where hence ye came. Betray not my secrets to the men of the north to the men, or to the men of the south, lest my curse fall upon you. Remember and heed my words, for surely I will return again and require uh, require of thee that which ye guard. A, even from behind, beyond time and from beyond death, I will return, rewarding or punishing as ye have requited your trust. In the biblical text of John 14, 20, Jesus declares to his followers, I go away and come again unto you. Tell no one the Son of Man uh, has risen again. Thoth says, for surely I will come again, betray not my secrets. You see, these things are very, very similar. So in, in one way, you have Thoth saying, listen, I'm, I'm teaching you guys some serious knowledge, some serious information, and I want you guys to not only understand it, digest it, and practice it, but also utilize it and live it. In other words, this is a lifestyle that he was teaching the people, not just you know, some, some information for them to hear in one ear or not the other. He was trying to teach them a lifestyle, an ascension lifestyle. And what he's saying is, when I come back, because this guy literally leaves and comes back every so many hundreds, sometimes thousands of years, 
when it, when I come back, if you guys fell off, I'm just going to cast you down. In other words, I'm going to destroy what you've built. I'm going to tear down your uh, your ideologies and rebuild you again from scratch. And then in the biblical account, you have Jesus virtually saying the same things. You know, I'm coming again. And when I come back, there's going to be an accounting. There's going to be accounting for what I, the stuff that I taught you. If you're living it, if you're living in that lifestyle, if you, have you obtained that lifestyle of ascension, that ascension knowledge lifestyle? And if you haven't, well, you're going to have an accounting to pay. You know, it's the same exact story. But the only thing is the biblical account was written from 100 AD to 900 AD. So we know that the animal tablets are super ancient. So what we're finding out here is that a lot of the stuff that comes in the New Testament is coming from that is written in the New Testament, I'm sorry, is coming from the Emerald Tablets, right? Let's take a look at it a little bit more. <clears throat> the Bible teaches us of a judgment day. Everyone, the still living and the resurrected dead, will face God's judgment. Even those who profess Christianity will find judgment through the deeds they have done in life, according to Matthew 7, 21 through 23 and 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Those who have lived righteous lives will be granted eternal life. Those who have lived evil lives will be condemned to eternal punishment. This record appears in several biblical package, passages, including Matthew 5, 29 through 30, 25, uh, 31, uh, chapter 30, 25, 31 through 46, and Mark 9, 43 through 48. Again, these statements are very reminiscent of the same thing stated by Thoth over 36,000 years ago. There's going to be an accounting. I'm going to hold you accountable for what you have learned and what you have done. Have you done good with the knowledge and you sustained that? Or have you uh, failed my trust? And if you have failed my trust, there's going to be an accounting. You see it replicated over and over again. It's the same exact information, the same exact statement. <clears throat> Did Jesus Christ, who is also referred to as Yeshua, teach reincarnation now this is a big topic here <laughs> that a lot of christians don't want to even dig into the fact that jesus is his um his teaching was primarily about reincarnation uh not about death and that's it and final and then some kind of magical way you appear in the uh in the afterlife actually that's not even what they teach so me being a student of Christianity and the Bible and many other religions as well, this is the actual teaching that you're taught uh, by in, in that faith. So if you're living the Christ, Christian lifestyle and you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then all your sins are going to be forgiven and you have a chance to be, you know, raptured up into this heavenly paradise. Now, there's a little bit of a glitch with that. In, one, in some accounts, you don't get raptured until the second coming of Christ. And so the people that have been, they call them the saints that have died in Christ, they're still in this um, abyss, spiritual abyss, where they can't go up or down. They're kind of stuck in this halfway realm. And they've been there for now thousands of years, literally. And still waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for this magical second coming of which they will be magically raptured up into, into heaven. You know, so I don't know. When you analyze some of the stuff that's written, you can you can clearly see when a man's hand and a man's consciousness is guiding some of the information and altering it and changing it to their own preference. Uh and the fact that there's evidence of this is William James Darby, who actually added the rapture to the Bible as a footnote, I believe in 1835, and which much later became part of doctrine as pastors uh, realized that, hey, we can utilize this to gain more followers to the faith. Okay, we give them the fear factor, but if they really, really, really try hard and they really give their life to this thing, and of course, and all their money, then they have a chance to get raptured away and not face 
uh, everlasting damnation. You see? It's all about control of people. Okay? That's what it's all about. It's all about the control of people. Thank you, Konifa, for the uh, for the donation. It's all about the control of people. So let's go back in again. So did Jesus teach reincarnation? <clears throat> Additionally, reincarnation appears in the Old Testament. Read the last words of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. Behold, I will send you, Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Here is God speaking through Malachi. He was a famous prophet often quoted by great leaders throughout history, including U.S. presidents, Donald Trump, and actually saying the, that Elijah is going to come again. Now we find Jesus making the same statement in the book of Matthew. Jesus says, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding that he is least in the kingdom of heaven and is greater than he, Matthew 11, 11. What they're saying is that these people that die are coming back. It's pretty interesting. Then he says, and if he will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come, Matthew 11 through 14, meaning his coming was prophesied. Therefore, Jesus said he came, he was beheaded. They did with him what they would. And so they will do the same to me. They predict their comings and their deaths and their returns again, which is pretty interesting. And it's the same thing that Thoth says uh, happens in the Emerald Tablets. Scriptures concerning the coming again of Elijah flow so prominently throughout the Bible that anyone can accept the fact that they appear within the context of an already established canon. If reincarnation is so important, why is it not taught in the West? Obviously, this guy dies and he comes back again. And it's talked about over and over and over again, the fact that now he's not coming back again in the spirit. He's coming back in the flesh. There's even more places, even in Revelations, that it talks about getting a new name and a new body and being coming back again in a physical body. Not in a spiritual body. It's in the book of Revelation. In a, in a, in a physical body with a new name, you, you come back, you're born again. You get a brand new body and a brand new name. And Thoth said, great were my people in the ancient days, great beyond the conception of the little people now around me. Knowing the wisdom of old, seeking far within the heart of infinity, knowledge that belonged to the earth's youth. Wise were we with the wisdom of the children of light who dwelt among us. Strong were we with the power drawn from the eternal fire. In Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water. He shall baptize you with fire. It's the same thing. And then Thoth said, And all of these, the greatest among the children of men was my father, thought me, keeper of the great temple, link between the child of light. Thought me is a Sumerian god, Enki. Also, John 12, 36 records the words of Jesus. Believe in the light that you may be the children of light. It's the same statement. It's the same exact statement, guys. It's the same exact statement. Thoth says, thought me the keeper of the great temple, link between the children of the light. And then John says in 1236, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. Same thing. This New Testament context is coming directly from the Emma Tablets. And Thoth said, who dwelt within the temple of the races of men who inhabited the ten islands, mouthpiece after the three of the dweller of Unal, speaking to the kings with the voice that must be obeyed. Grew I there from a child into manhood, being taught by my father the elder mysteries, until the time grew within the fire of wisdom, until it burst into a consuming flame. Thoth is literally talking about the fact that He's and he's already gone into this mystery school. He's now part of this mystery school, these teachings by the ancient elders 
that are literally enlightening him and giving him the knowledge and the wisdom that he needs to last for a millennia and then teach to people that will then uh, take a fractal of that knowledge and it will last for a millennia. And what's interesting is when you look at the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, which is a little unknown uh, scripture where it talks about Jesus going to Egypt and actually uh, basically attending the Egyptian history schools, what do you think he was learning? He was learning this. The founder of the mystery schools, Thoth, he was learning directly from him. He was learning these same exact words and these same exact principles and ideologies in which he was regurgitating literally to the people of his era and of his time. Because I do believe that he was a man that really walked because I've been to the house that he lived in in Egypt. Okay, it's a real place. He was really there. He actually lived there. It's a shrine now. You can go there. Whoever's going to Egypt with me uh, in October, there's only six spots left for that trip. That trip sold out so fast. But whoever's going with me, we're going to the house where he actually lived when he disappeared out of the modern canonized Bible and was actually uh, living in Egypt, learning the Egyptian mysteries before he went to Tibet to learn uh, Reiki and all the other type of stuff there, healing and energy, energy, energy healing and Qigong, and then learning, going down into India and learning the mystic arts. That's what you read when you when you start. That's what you find out when you start reading a lot of these texts. The truth, a lot of information that's missing, right? Thoth has a rich tradition to prepare his life as the ultimate servant of all of Atlantis. His father thought me is identifiable with Enki as well as the dweller. So the dweller and Enki and thought me are the same person who taught him the elder mysteries, the mysteries, the secret mysteries. The knowledge he acquired at this level of wisdom is so overwhelming that it's like an, uh, that it's like an all-consuming fire, much like many religions today speak of being consumed by the fire of God or the unquenchable fire of the Holy Spirit. This, these ideologies and these, these archetypes are all going back to the original teachings of Thoth from the Emerald Tablets. And Thoth said, not desired I, but the attainment of wisdom, until on a great day the command came from the dweller of the temple that I be brought before him. Few there were among the children of men who had looked upon the mighty face and lived, for not as the sons of men are the children of light when they are the incarnate of a physical body. Chosen was I from the sons of men, taught by the dweller so that his purposes might be fulfilled. And you look at Matthew 24, 30 states, and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. Thoth is about to come into his glory, okay? You have to understand these sayings, son of man. What's the first thing that Thoth said when he descended on the land of Kem? In the beginning of the Emerald Tablets, he sent by his father, Enki, to the land of Kem because the great flood had happened and the water was residing and the great temples were coming up out of the mud. Civilization had been completely destroyed and his mission was to go there and help bring them back up to a high level of civilization. That was his mission, according to the tablets. He descends in his ship, he opens the door, and what happens? They come to attack him with cudgels and spears, according to Thoth, and he, he pulls up his staff and he sends out a ray of vibration, a ray of vibration stopping him still a stone in the mountain. He actually freezes them with some kind of stun gun weapon, right? It doesn't kill them, it just stops them from attacking which in my book, I talk about the fact that we have something called the active denial system in the military does the same exact thing. And he's there to teach them this wisdom and this knowledge and bring them back up to a higher level of civilization. And, you know, he's, he's there to fulfill his mission, which is to be the bringer of knowledge. And he does this, he, he does this again in the land of chem. The land of chem is where we get chemistry, and alchemy all comes out of the land of Chem. That's where chemistry and alchemy originate from. And then from there, it's spread around the world, right? After the Great Flood. And um, it's really interesting that we're talking about the Son of Man. 
Once Thoth freezes these people with this stunning ray, and then he releases them, and he goes over to them, and he shows them his magic science, in other words, his advanced technology, and they start to grovel at his feet because now they think he's really a god. And he tells them, no, 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 no. Don't do that. I'm not a god. He says, what do you say? I'm the son of Atlantis. He refers to himself as a son of Atlantis and always, and again, refers to himself as a son of man. Those are his two references. He never says, I'm God. He never says, I'm here to rule over you. I'm your, I'm, I'm your creator. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm a son of Atlantis. And then further down, he says, I'm a son of man. He says, I'm the son of man. He never says, I'm the son of God. He never says, I, I, I'm, the, uh, I'm your creator of all, or none of that kind of stuff. You see? And so we find very in interesting similarities between what, when Jesus is talking, and he's always referring to himself as the son of man. Pretty interesting. <clears throat> and those said, purposes yet unborn in the womb of time, long ages I dwelt in the temple, learning ever yet and more wisdom until I do approach the light emitted from the great fire. Taught me he the path to a menti, the underworld where the great king sits upon his throne of might. Deep I bowed in homage before the lords of life and the lords of death, receiving my gift, the key of life, that's the ankh. Free was I of the halls of Amenti, bound not by death of the circle of life. He had conquered death. Thoth is talking about the fact that he had literally been given the key of life, which is the, which is the, which is the ankh, but not just any old ankh. He was given a jed pillar ankh, and he's able to walk through the gates, the stargates. Also, what's interesting here, uh, and there's depictions of this in Egypt, which when you go with me in October, you will see these with your own eyes. It's pretty interesting. Some of the first original baptisms and things like that are all in the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And um, what's interesting, though, is the fact that um, he's talking about being free from death. He had now conquered death. He now has the capability to transfer his consciousness into new avatar bodies. In which, further in the tablets, he talks about the fact that he's got these halls of Amenti where he has these rejuvenation chambers. And he would have his bodies in these chambers and he would transfer from body to body, walk amongst man, but unlike a man, he says. In other words, he's not stealing people's bodies. He's, he's, um, he's walking amongst men, but unlike a man. In other words, he's, he's in a sleeve he, and he understands the concept of being in that sleeve. Whereas we're in a sleeve and we don't, we, and we think the sleeve is part, it's, it's us. This is just the mode of transportation through a third dimension. It's not really us at all. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's see if I can find another good correlation here. Just pretty interesting stuff I was just going over. And I was like, you know, people need to, <laughs> need to see this. And Doug said, he who encouraged would dare the dark, realm, dark realms, let him be purified first and long fasting. Lie in the sarcophagus of stone in my chamber. He's talking about the sarcophagus or really the stone box is inside the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. It's not for death. It's not for a dead pharaoh. There's another purpose to that. Let him be purified by, by long fasting. Lie in the sarcophagus of stone in my chamber. Then reveal I to him the great mysteries. So if you lay in that stone box inside of the um, king's chamber of the great pyramid and you take a mallet and you hit that, that granite coffer with the, on the outside with the mallet, you get this amazing two to one resonance throughout the entire chamber, which creates all of these almost psychedelic experiences uh, and you gain knowledge. So he says, then I revealed to him the great mysteries. Soon shall he follow to where I shall meet him, because you actually have an out-of-body experience. Even in the darkness of earth shall I meet him. I, Thoth, Lord of wisdom, meet him and hold him and dwell with him always. Jesus answered him, saying, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's the same exact scenario, same exact sentiment, just says slightly in a different way. 
Pretty interesting. There's so many of these in here that I can go on and on and on. And what we have to understand is that a lot of the verses where Jesus really, Yeshua, is speaking in the in the Bible is really fragments and fractals of what he learned in the Egyptian mystery schools that was taught by Thoth, the Atlantean priest king, and what he wrote in his Emerald Tablets. He was almost quoting this stuff, putting his own slight spin or turn on it, um, or generalizing it, but this is where he got the information from. This is why this book has done so well, in my, because people, I mean, you can go from page up to page to page with this kind of information, and you'll find that uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of correlations between this and the Bible. And you have to, again, ask yourself, which came first, the chicken or the egg? That's what you have to ask yourself. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? And it's pretty deep because he goes into cymatic frequencies. He goes into all these things. Uh, he goes into the mystery of 369 by Nikola Tesla before Nikola Tesla was born. Right? Nikola Tesla most likely learned it from the Emerald Tablets as well himself. So it's just really interesting to me that we have, you know, these correlations and then again, when you, when you, you know, as a person that's religious or that's believing in that faith, they just don't want to research these things. They don't want to look into it. If you take, if you tell them that, if you show them this, they're going to tell you that you're worshiping something, Satan, even though you're not worshiping this, this is something that, you know, it's something that brings you knowledge. You go, oh, but I got this because this guy did so much amazing work in the ancient past. I want to learn about his wisdom and his knowledge. And if you start looking at things like this and researching things like this, then you're a demon. You're a demon. I've been called demons and all kinds of stuff, right? Just the other day, I think it was two days ago, some crazy lady started commenting on all my posts and all my videos, all this crazy stuff about you're a demon, you're worshiping Satan and blah, 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 blah. So what happens in religion, these people turn into zealots. If people who are into... Um, you know, Christianity, for example, ever did the full research on Yeshua and ever find, and got all the apocrypha texts and found out where he was, what he did, what he studied, and what he was really teaching, I think it'd be a huge eye-opener, which is why I do these videos. People need to understand that there's a lot more to the story than what they've been told, you know? You know, the, just like, for example, Isis, Osiris, and Horus are the, you know, the original trinity, right? That's the original trinity. And Isis had a, you know, a baby, basically gave birth to Horus uh, without having sex. So she gave birth to Horus. She had a, you know, uh, you want to call it a in vitro fertilization, whatever you want to call it. But that's the original setting for the story. And then from there, after getting passed down from generation to generation, it turns into, you know, Jesus, Mary, you know, Mary, Mary being the virgin birth, uh, giving birth to Jesus as a virgin birth, I'm sorry. And then uh, having a holy trinity, which is based on, uh, you know, you know, the Holy Ghost and, and, and all these things. But it's, it's, it's not that. That's a copy from ancient Egypt. It originated from ancient Egypt. But the problem that we have is people don't like to do the research. They don't like to study. That's why I made a book like this where you can go read verse by verse and you can break down tablet verses versus biblical verses and you can kind of see where a lot of the information really truly originated from. And we have to come to a point where if you're so confident in your religion, well, then challenge it. Not challenge your creator because that's kind of ignorant, but I'm saying challenge the information you've been taught. Say, hey, you know, um, if there was only Adam and Eve, then how did Cain find a wife when he got kicked out of the garden? You know, questions like that. Um, obviously, there were people on the planet. Why would God tell him that when you go out there, you're going to find a wife and I'll put a mark on your head so the people don't kill you? What people? You know, questions like that. When you dig into... A lot of the ancient texts, especially the Sumerian texts, because it originates in Mesopotamia and you're researching the Tigris River and Euphrates River and 
you're researching the entire region and you're looking at the Red Sea and, and all of this. And then I start to make some correlations between some Sumerian stories and what happened with Moses. And I'm like, this is pretty interesting. So what I did was I took the, uh, the text and I back converted it down several different languages to get more sort of source language. And you find that the biblical version is actually a mistranslation. Moses never crossed the Red Sea. And they're still teaching this in Bibles and, and, and Bible study and, and churches today. Moses never crossed the Red Sea. He crossed the Sea of Reeds. Now, it's, a, it's nearby the Red Sea. It's a much smaller sea and actually a little bit easier to cross. I'm not taking anything away from the story in terms of that, but I'm saying things like that are very, very crucial. Now, what's interesting about the Sea of Reeds, I did the research on the geology because you can do the research on the geology of the planet going back thousands of years. If you do a geological rewind in that region, based on tectonic plate movement, there would have been a massive quake, which would have caused a massive tsunami around that same exact time, which would have what? Sucked all the water out of the sea. Have you ever seen a tsunami? Before it comes ashore, it sucks the water away from the shore, clean, clears it out. Just a few years ago, there was an image of one where an entire beach was dried out for hours before the water came crashing back. So you have a similar account where Moses, and I don't think it was even Moses, the person who actually took the people, and those people weren't slaves of the Pharaoh. There was never a slave of any Pharaohs. When you go to Egypt, you're going to learn this firsthand. There were no slaves. Slaves never existed in Egypt for, for building pyramids and all this kind of hard work and labor. These people, that not, there were slaves that existed, don't get me wrong, but these people that were claimed to be building all these pyramids and doing the work for the Pharaoh like that on that level, that didn't exist. When you go to Egypt and you find that they have all the medical records of the workers, they have, these workers had insurance. They had a rudimentary form of insurance. They had paychecks and all their paycheck records are still there and were left behind. Left behind paycheck records. People were getting paid to work out there on those temples and those pyramids. There were no slaves. What happened was the story of Moses has been completely skewed and, and turned. So the true Moses is Akhenaten, Pharaoh Akhenaten. Pharaoh Akhenaten, who was worshiping Amun-Ra, who was one of the rulers and still right, right now really is ruling this entire planet. Amun-Ra is still ruling until Pisces fully, fully ends. Okay, and Aquarius begins. That's in 2025. So Amun-Ra took over, also known in the Bible as Marduk, and also known in the Sumerian tablets as Marduk as well, uh, in Egypt known as Marduk Amun-Ra. He took over kingship in the age of Pisces, which are those little fish that you see Christians running around with on the back of their cars. They think it's representing the, the, the multitude of fish by Jesus, but it's not. The Pisces symbol represents the kingship handed down to Amun-Ra, if you go back in ancient times. That's what it, that's the original meaning of it. So they're riding around with one of the most evil, brutal rulers, symbols on the back of their cars and their vans and their minivans and everything else. They don't even, they don't even, <laughs> don't even realize it. But anyway, so Amun-Ra uh, is the guy who, he's also known as Aten, the sun disc, because he mostly rules from his disc in the sky. That's why they call him Aten, the disc. And he would communicate with Akhenaten as a pharaoh. He would communicate directly to him. He had Akhenaten try to usher in monotheism, a one God religion. Because at that time, everybody, there were so many gods, you know, the pantheon of gods existed. And what uh, Aten was, he said he was a very jealous God. This is Amun-Ra. There'll be no other God but me, which also made it into the Bible. Uh, and, uh, you know, he does the good and the evil. That's and that's in the Bible as well. And so he started telling Pharaoh uh, Akhenaten, I want you to, 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 to start erasing everything about these other gods, deface all the other gods. Those are his relatives, actually. So Akhenaten started having his military go around and start chiseling away all the faces of all the other gods, Thoth, Isis, you know, Horus, 
Osiris, Ramses, anybody, whoever was out there that was considered to be, you know, holy and God and, and to be worshipped and to be thought of as a living God, he wanted them all defaced. One God system that uh, Aten was trying to usher in, and he started ordering this to be done. Break the faces off the statues, break the noses off, break the ears off. All this stuff was done a long time ago, guys, a very, very long time ago. And proof of this, they just found another ancient statue that they dug up that had been buried for thousands of years. And guess what? The face was chiseled off and so was the nose and the ears and everything else. This is how old, this is how far back this goes. So uh, Akhenaten was, uh, got in trouble for this. Eventually the people turned on him, the military turned on him, the other politicians turned on him. And it's like, look, dude, you got to get the hell out of here. You, you, you destroying everything. You destroying our, erasing our history. You going around erasing everything. And so he had been building his following base. He had become an influencer, right? A religious influencer for people who wanted to believe in monotheism. And he acquired a huge following in that regard. And that following of him and these followers who wanted to go with this one God system, worshiping our men, were kicked out of the kingdom. Okay, they were forced out. They were forced out. Now, what did Akhenaten do? Well, he went to the Great Pyramid and he had the Ark of the Covenant removed. What do you mean? Well, let me tell you. That box that Thoth talks about laying in that will send you out into other dimensions through consciousness is the same exact dimensions as the Ark of the Covenant. As a matter of fact, because the Great Pyramid had lost its um, ability to generate power efficiently because the Nile had kind of wiggled itself away from the pyramid complex over time. It was broken because it, they needed that aquifer underneath the pyramid to create physio, physiostatic electricity. So what happens is the um, that box was put there, that stone coffer, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was put inside of it to add extra, an extra power boost because we know that it generated power because scientists at uh, a university in America recreated it based just on the biblical information, and it created so much, so much of a power spark, they had to shut it down. The arc coming out of it, the arc of electricity coming out of it was, was incredible. So this thing was a power source, this arc, and they put it in there to complete the broken part of the Great Pyramid that had stopped you know, allowing it to generate power. And why is this important? Because when Akhenaten was forced out of Egypt, him and his followers, they went to the Great Pyramid and they took the Ark, the source of Egypt's power, literally. And they fled with that. And when they fled with it, that's when the Pharaoh sent the army after him. And that's when uh, Akhenaten and his people crossed over the Sea of Reeds, not the Red Sea, and crossed into safety as the water from that tsunami came crushing back killing the majority of the uh, of the chariots. And that's most likely really what happened. Pretty interesting stuff, guys. Pretty, pretty interesting stuff. You know, so uh, there's so much crisscross that has happened over time um, and so much human input that has gone into changing stories around to get to the story that's, that's there now even including, you know, the Ten Commandments, which literally come from the 42 Laws of Mayot. That's where the Ten Commandments come from, you know. Uh, just little things like that. Uh, and so Moses, in my opinion, really was Pharaoh Akhenaten. And then after they got rid of Akhenaten, uh, his son took over. They forced him into to kingship and to, to pledge allegiance to them. And then they killed him. All right, so they killed King Tut. Because, uh, uh, you know, you had uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten and you had King Tut. They killed King Tut. Uh, and then they got that back their full control because they didn't want King Tut to try to seek vengeance for his father's, uh, you know, situation. So they said, you know what? You know, you guys kicked my dad out of here, but I'm going to get you back. So they decided to kill kill King Tut. So they got rid of him. And then they went back into their, their, you know, their system again that they had going on. But meanwhile, that monotheistic system, that mindset had caught, caught on. And people started building churches. Uh, so the, the temples of Isis, which were all around the ancient land of Kem in those days in Egypt, 
they started converting those into churches. This is long before Jesus even existed. They started turning them into Coptic Christian churches. So Christianity has literally nothing to do with Jesus, although Christians will tell you that it's all about Jesus. It started and formed long before Jesus ever even was a thought. Okay. And uh, it, it came, you know, Judaism and Christianity is all virtually the same thing. Uh, the only thing that's slightly different, obviously, is Islam. And they they believe that um, uh, Gabriel or, J, you know, Jibril, but also the real name is Gabriel, if you want to speak it in English, came and uh, and brought these, these uh, you know, this information to Muhammad, who couldn't read or write himself, but he had to hire somebody to come in, maybe as a volunteer and and, and be the person that, to write down all these words. And so Gabriel would recite this information to Muhammad and Muhammad would recite it to this other guy who would write it all down. And that's how you come up with that whole faith. And then of course, Muhammad goes to the location where the Dome of the Rock is today on an appointed time and he's taken up into space by these angels. He, alien abductions, what it was. He got, he got abducted by aliens. He got, they took him away took him into space and brought him back. But the spot and the location where he was taken away from at the Dome of the Rock, the reason why they built that temple there is because the spot where he was standing, there was an indention in the stone, a giant circular indention exactly where he was standing, where witnesses saw him getting beamed up into space. Pretty interesting stuff. If you look at this stuff from the perspective of magic and you know mysticism and people with magic wands that have power, you know, to, to, to do this kind of stuff. Well, then, of course, all this stuff is going to make sense to you the way you were taught. But if you look at it as a logical human being that does research on language, linguistics, that does research on science and physics, that does research on, um, you know, uh, basic, a, a basic understanding of, of civilizations, kind of like a a basic bare bones understanding of anthropology. If you can tap into those things, those three or four things, you start to see the whole story a lot differently. When you start getting and picking up a lot of these, um, you know, they, like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and you start reading that, and you start saying, man, this sounds like a lot of stuff from the Bible, but this thing is ancient. It's older than the Bible. You start to realize a lot of stuff. And what's interesting, I think the people that come to me, come with me to Egypt in October are going to have a phenomenal time. It's really going to be incredible because you're going to see some things and get confirmation on things that you were thinking, you know, were real or you thought about before in terms of a concept or idea. It's going to be confirmed when you get there. and You're going to be like, wow, this is real. This is real. This is how it happened. When you're standing next to an uh, obelisk that is, you know, <laughs> 200 yards and weighs, you know, two, 3,000 tons. And you and, and, and you hear somebody on the side of us saying, oh, yeah, they put this on a boat and brought it over here. You're going to laugh. You're going to realize there's no way they put this thing on a boat. This thing was moved here by some other method. You know, so it's just going to be an amazing eye-opening event. Um, there are six tickets or six seats left.